When you think about searching for lost media, usually the interest is in the cool topics like cartoon pilots from your childhood that you've never seen before, or early builds of video games that very few people have ever played. But sometimes you find yourself looking for something that is the complete opposite of these topics, and is notably of bad quality. Content that is either so badly written that nobody even bothered starting a search for it, or content that is so strange and bizarre, it feels like it shouldn't even exist, though it does. There are even some topics that have been known to be bad for years, but the interest in its history has led some people to search for those. It might not even be surprising to consider that pieces of content go missing for the fact that they're so bad people didn't think about saving them in the first place. And today, we're going to take a look at some topics that fit this weird and odd category, beginning with one of my favorite bad lost media topics that I've really had an interest in. There's no better way to start off a video that discusses bad lost media than by talking about, in my opinion, one of the worst pieces of lost media that remains almost entirely lost. This is surprising because it feels like it's been around forever, but it's the fact that it's so bad and poorly documented, I don't think anyone cares about getting the rest of the series found. This is Dot Comedy, a TV series that focused on bringing early internet content and culture to the mainstream audience. It premiered in December 2000 and has a premise set up similar to America's Funniest Home Videos, where the series was hosted by personalities who introduced and commented on the clips and segments that were shown, which in this case involved all things related to online. Dot Comedy was hosted by the Sklar Brothers, and several clips from the first episode can be seen online which include a look at someone who collects barf bags, and a visit to a computer accessory convention where wackiness ensues. It goes without saying that the show focused on comedy, but unfortunately, this is also where it falls short, because for a series that's supposed to be funny, it comes off as more cynical than anything else, and as a result, the series was cancelled after one episode. While it was ambitious to bring this kind of content to a mainstream audience back then, the show just wasn't received well either, and I think it's entirely because of the way it was written. Rather than laughing with the people and content that showcased, it feels like everyone is laughing at them. I think if there was a larger focus on funny animations or interesting features of the internet, the show would have acted as a cool time capsule to look back on all these years later. Not to mention, the energy of the show is pretty low, and in some ways, it feels very boring, like it's not something that the viewers would even find interesting to begin with, which is probably why the single episode that aired only amassed 4.1 million viewers, and hasn't even resurfaced in full. There were an additional 4 episodes that were filmed, but never aired, and these have also never resurfaced. Back when I first heard about the topic and became interested in it, I attempted to find these episodes, and reached out to an editor of the series, hoping he'd have the rest of them. He took a while to accept my request, and by the time I realized he had, I was researching other topics and never followed up or attempted to search for these lost episodes again. Though what's even more interesting was another contact I made with someone whose resume matched up exactly with crew lists I had found elsewhere, but they claimed to have no involvement with the show, so I made it a joke that they just didn't want to admit they were associated with it. And while I was doing research for this video, I discovered that there apparently was a UK version as well, with the same name, but that show seems to be even harder to find than the ABC version. I couldn't find any content from it. Even back when I was first researching this topic, information was pretty scarce, with the only clips having been buried pretty well on YouTube, and a couple short ads too. If the series had continued, there's a chance it might have changed direction and become more of that archival show I wish it was. So maybe the rest of the episodes are slightly better than what I've seen, 
And it feels like such an easy show to find, I bet we could uncover this one without a lot of effort. What's the worst Nintendo game you can think of? Hotel Mario? Metroid Federation Force? Maybe the Mario All-Stars Collection? Well, I'm sure none of these games even come close to a topic that I first came across a long time ago, but didn't think it actually existed, so I never looked into it, and let it live on as an urban legend. However, some new information has been discovered that proves this game's existence, and it raises so many more questions about it compared to when the game was only claimed to exist. This topic comes from the rabbit hole of Nintendo Flash games. These were little mini-games that were made exclusively for their website, and usually promoted a specific game that was being released on console. A lot of these games were only up at a time when nobody thought about preserving them, so most people only have memories of playing them, and there remain a lot that have become lost and haven't resurfaced. But one game in particular, seems to have been forgotten by most people, despite it being one of the most notable for all the wrong reasons. And believe it or not, it originates from an issue of Nintendo Power magazine. This is the screenshot in question that has been passed around for years, an article from the magazine about Waluigi promoting his appearance in Mario Tennis. It goes on to describe how he's tired of Mario's reign as the video game king, so as a celebration for Waluigi being in the game, he gets his own website. The website listed is waluigi.com, which according to Wayback Machine, was just a redirect to the Mario Tennis site. But the article states it had all kinds of information and screenshots on the character, including a Flash game. This game is mentioned specifically in the article as Waluigi's Toenail Clipping Party, and is described as... It seems that everyone's favorite mustachioed mischief maker has let his personal grooming go, and it's up to you to help him. Clip those nails good and make sure to aim for the jar, or you'll be left with ragged clippings and toe jam all over your hard drive. Ew. It seems like several different gameplay elements were featured, but we're not sure how the game played, because it's currently lost. Though it was this article, that made people question whether or not the game actually existed. And back when someone shared it with me years ago, I figured there was no way this was real. It was probably like that safari room ghost in Luigi's Mansion, just flavor text to spice up the writing. However, I recently came across a thread on the Lost Media Wiki forums that put the URL into the Wayback Machine and recovered the SWF file that was connected to the game. Yep. Take all that in for a moment. This could be played at one point in time, and Nintendo themselves made it. There were some other URLs that were discovered, listed as Paint the Lines and Deface Painting, so it seems as though there were other Mario Tennis games which are lost as well. Flash content is actually an area of lost media I'm not too familiar with, especially when it comes to games specifically from Nintendo, so I'm not sure how likely or easily this one will be to find. But I'm way more interested in finding the story behind this game, rather than the game itself. There's a line in the article that states, Waluigi wants to overthrow Mario for being the video game king, and in protest he gets his own sight. So you'd think Waluigi would create his own competition game, or something to rival Mario, but toenail clippings is so weird it doesn't even feel related. What's even weirder is another part of the article that states, Waluigi sold Luigi's underwear on eBay, which begs the question of whether or not this is actually the rarest Nintendo collectible of all time, and feels like it's even farther away from a solution for Waluigi to compete with the Mario Bros. But I think my favorite takeaway from this topic is the fact that all of this is apparently canon. For as popular as Seaman got around the time the Angry Video Game Nerd made his episode on the Dreamcast game, the series seems to have slipped back into obscurity, and I don't see a lot of people talking about it or using it for memes, which is too bad. My contribution to the Seaman community was bringing awareness to the UFO plushes, which are some of the rarest plushes I've ever bought, 
and even though these two took several years to find, I'm still missing the majority of the set. But there are a couple other interesting parts of the Seaman series that I think are worth talking about, one of which is Seaman 2, a sequel to the original game that most people aren't even aware exists. This game was only released in Japan on the PS2, and while it's not lost media, I do think the design of the characters are truly a wonder of nature, and I wish a localized version of this game existed. But there's another Seaman game that doesn't exist because it was cancelled, and by far, could have been the best entry of the series for how easy it would be to spend time with your Seaman pet. Forget having to turn on your console and use the microphone attachment to interact with it. This cancelled game in the series was putting Seaman on PC. In December 2000, several gaming websites reported that a PC version of the game titled Seaman for Windows would be available in the first quarter of 2001, but this wouldn't be the same Seaman that was on Dreamcast. The PC version would be a completely different game. In fact, it was going to be less of a game and more of a communication tool for your desktop. Screenshots were released that show this concept. Seaman swimming around the desktop and interacting with your files. The program is launched when the computer is turned on, and continues to run in the background with your other applications. But Seaman was rendered much smaller than the Dreamcast version to not be too distracting. Seaman would also speak to you and read your calendar, as well as allow you to send Seaman themed attachments and messages to friends which could only be read if the recipient had the Seaman program as well. It looks like a lot of thought was being put into this program, and according to one of the better articles from IGN that details the specifics, there were even plans to add functionality with future updates, which was scheduled to release in the second quarter of 2001. Unfortunately, even with all the plans that were made for the program, none of it seemed to materialize in the way it was planned. But with some more research, it seems that something relating to the project did come out. This is Seamail, a program for Windows that released in 2003, and retains similar functionality to the 2001 project with some differences. It's been uploaded to Internet Archive, so you can download it and check it out for yourself, though this appears to only be one version of the game, featuring Baby Gilman, where the other has Adult Gilman. I'm not sure what happened to the original concept, or how much of it was reworked here, but an article from GameSpot dated 2006 describes slightly different features from the 2001 version, so it's possible there were several different iterations of the game that were being worked on. These gaming articles also mention no word on a localized version, but given this project's long development and the unpopularity of Seaman in the US, I'm not surprised we never got any kind of PC application. I feel like I can't possibly talk about Bad Lost Media without mentioning another member of the Bad Lost Media Hall of Fame, because when I think about topics that fit this category, this one always gets brought up. While it's not lost anymore, there was a time when it was, and it's pretty unbelievable to think that the episodes were recovered, and that anyone even wanted to save them in the first place. This is Woolen Warriors, and if you've never heard of this series before, I wouldn't be surprised, as it had one of the shortest runs of any show on Cartoon Network, lasting two episodes. The series is an adaptation of a Taiwanese puppet drama called Peely, and aired on Toonami in 2006, but was cancelled as a result of poor ratings. There were a lot of issues with the show in itself, with the most notable probably being the fact that it was a puppet show being aired on Toonami. I was actively watching Toonami at the time of its premiere, not knowing what the heck was going on or why the show looked so different from anything else Toonami was playing at the time. But the second reason for its cancellation was the poor localization it received. This included changing character personalities and plot lines, most famously making Scar, who doesn't speak in the original series, to an annoying pizza-obsessed whiner, and I would argue the line about the pizza oracle is probably the best thing to have come from the series. 
There are some old interviews with the Toonami crew, and they discussed how Woolen Warriors came into existence, which was entirely the idea of the network executives, who wanted to pick it up, despite the rest of the crew knowing it wouldn't work. There were a total of 13 episodes produced, and the majority of them never aired, which is funny because it was even more confusing as a kid that this puppet show appeared for a couple weeks, then disappeared without any announcement. I don't even recall seeing any announcements that the show was going to premiere at all, it just showed up one day. The result of this early cancellation meant that the rest of the episodes had to get dumped somewhere, so it was decided to put them on the AOL Kids website, where they would stay until that was shut down, and they remained lost for years. Until Woolen Warriors Unofficial recovered the episodes and uploaded them all to YouTube, making the entire series available to watch. Even though the series is pretty bad and hard to watch, it's really an interesting product of the mid-2000s, when localization was still all over the place, and it's even more unbelievable that someone cared enough to save them all. I did go back and re-watch some of the series a while ago, and it wasn't as bad as I remembered it, but it definitely would have been better suited for Adult Swim or just localized in a way that could be taken more seriously and less for kids. This one might be a bit of a controversial entry on the list, because while the original mystery about this content was certainly interesting, it's strange to think that a rabbit hole of them exist, and for that reason it makes me place it on this list. You might remember a piece of lost media that I covered last year, involving a Burger King employee training disc that was made for the CDI console. We didn't even believe this was real at first, until I looked into the comment that mentioned its existence, and then several articles that discussed an entire program around these discs were discovered. However, even this information was scarce, and the creator of the discs himself confirmed to me that he didn't have any content from his time working on the project, so the mystery was really up in the air. This was until months later, when a copy of one of the training discs was located at the Home Computer Museum and uploaded online for us to finally see for ourselves. It's been claimed that seven different discs in total were made, and since this find only included one of them, the search was far from over but it seems like we're getting more where that came from, as the search for training discs continues, not with Burger King, but with a completely different company. Not too long ago, I came upon another thread from the Lost Media Wiki forums, that got my attention because it mentioned the existence of Kmart CDI training discs, and similar to the first Burger King comment that came forward, I also believed this was a troll and that it didn't actually exist. I couldn't have been more wrong, however, because the thread discussed details from an employee who was a part of this training program, stating, During the second day of training, the manager pulled out a Philips CD player, or so I originally thought, and put in a disc labeled Kmart Associate Training, or something like that. I wish I remembered what it said, but it happened so long ago that it's mostly just a blur now. Anyway, we were introduced to how the CDI worked. It was so impressive and awful at the same time. In the mid-1990s, I had never been introduced to anything so interactive. I only remember one of the discs with reasonable detail. It mostly centered around the big Kmart format that had recently been introduced and rolled out. The new format also ushered in the Martha Stewart Everyday product line, which was yet another big focus of the disc. I worked at that Kmart store until the company filed for a Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in January 2002. There were a few leads mentioned in the thread, such as an article that was written about the topic, and a tweet asking if the Home Computer Museum had any copies. The last post was in April, and mentioned possibly contacting corporate or taking a hands-on approach and searching eBay for Kmart memorabilia but nothing has come from either of those places yet. I haven't been following the search too closely, but it has been on my radar. However, just when I thought this CDI search couldn't go any further, I learned through a comment left on one of my videos 
that apparently Applebee's was training their employees with CDI discs as well. So there's another group of programs out there that counts as lost media. And it makes me wonder how many other companies chose this format for employee training. It probably seemed like a good idea at the time for these companies. And it's interesting to think about how this business decision from so long ago has led to a lost media search for content that keeps going. And there are so many other pieces of lost media that are like this that you've probably heard about before. A Day with Spongebob could even be considered bad lost media for the low quality DVDs from the company that was supposed to produce it. But without a doubt, it has its fair share of points that make it good. It all comes down to how you choose to see each piece of lost media, which is another cool part of the community and keeps it interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a huge fan of dot comedy out there that already has all the episodes, not knowing they're still lost. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to check out some of my other lost media videos. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.